cap the, the, the stock market. Most of the investors in the stock market are passive, right? They're index funds, they're mutual funds, they're exchange traded funds. Many investors trade all the time. It's a very healthy thing for the market to have someone place a bet where they buy 10% of a company and where they are, take a business that has underperformed for 10 years and bring in a CEO like Hunter Harrison and turn around a railroad. That's a great thing for the market and it's a very healthy thing for the economy. You're about transactions. You know, you want to buy and then you want to sell and you want to make a huge profit. Now, we can, it may be you want to buy after 10 years or 15 years, sell after 15 years, but it's a transactional thing. Rather than spending a whole lot of money uh, to really run a business and create a product and do all those kinds of things, you know the argument. Even Paul Volcker's made this argument. Too many people are going to Wall Street, too many smart people mm -hmm. and, and working with you. And it's all about transactions, yeah, I don't, I don't not think... about building something. Well, let me, let, me, let me take a counter to that okay. in terms of what we do. So we're not about transactions at all. In fact, we do very few transactions, maybe one or two a year. Okay. We buy stakes I mean, in business. You're not a pure trader. We're not a trader at all. Investor. We don't trade. We buy a stake in a business. We get actively involved in the business. We work to make the business more valuable. And by the way, pretty much everything we've ever owned, with the exception of borders, has a higher value today than it did after we sold it which means that the impact that we've had on the business has been positive. I'm also an, you know, an executive officer of a business. I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of a company called Howard Hughes. This is a business that I created. It's a business I created by taking 34 assets outside of general growth, sticking them into a new company, recruiting a management team, right. building a board of directors, uh, and this company is doing marvelous things. So, for example, in, in New York City, we own the South Street Seaport. Uh, management team, again, I want to take credit for their work, but what they've accomplished is they've got approvals to do a new uh, they're going to completely transform the seaport. They're going to do a new, new development there. We're building uh, a new shopping center uh, in, uh, in Las Vegas. We're changing kind of the landscape in Hawaii with a 60-acre development of 9 million square feet of, of real estate. So these are companies that are building and adding enormous value in the business. That would not have happened uh, were we not to have taken a stake in general growth and spun off that entity. What about Procter & Gamble? Uh, Procter & Gamble, a uh, great company. Uh, we, uh, 175 years of, you know, generally pretty fabulous successes. Mm -hmm. Great brand names. Great brand names. Uh, last four years have been very difficult for the company. Yeah. Uh, and you came in adamant to remove Bob McDonald. Uh, the, you know, we thought it was time. He was CEO. And uh, by the way, was, he hadn't been there that long. He had been there about uh, four years. Okay, that's not and, a long time. And uh, he had been with the company obviously a long period of time. Yeah. And uh, you know, the because most of the capital in the stock market is passive. Investors can't themselves make these kind of changes. So they rely on someone to take a lead, okay, which we did in Procter & Gamble. By the way, in Procter & Gamble, I worked very quietly with the lead director. We would speak periodically. It was only when we felt it was time that I made a public presentation about what I, the concerns were at P&G. And a couple of weeks later, Bob, I think, resigned of his own of his own doing. Now, that stock's gone, you know, it's up and 35%. And the former CEO's come back, one of the legendary names. And A.J. Laffley's a fabulous CEO, and uh, I think he's going to do a great job turning the business. He's also working on recruiting the next founder of the company. But as a, you know, I got enormous number of phone calls from Procter & Gamble alums uh, thanking us for the work that we did at, at P&G. And the same thing is true at, at General Growth. I mean, if you look at the Buxbaum family, had a $5 billion net worth going into mm -hmm. the the uh, financial crisis that was down to 25 million when the uh, general growth stock went from 63 to dollars a share to 20 or 30 cents we helped take it back to 34 dollars a share that's been a great thing not just for a wealthy family but for the the pension funds that own that stock for the you know i get thank you notes from investors who've invested alongside us so what's the drive for you what's the motivation um one i think what we do is important I think I'm making, you know, I do a lot of... So you're making companies stronger because you come in and you have a certain amount of power because you have a certain amount of investment and therefore you would like to say that if you look at your track record, you do much better in making companies stronger than you do in weakening companies in any way. That's absolutely true. I mean, I don't think anyone would ever accuse us of weakening a business. Now, J.C. Penney, not every investment is going to work out. You know, uh, there was more risk in J.C. Penney than pretty much every other investment we've made because of the nature of the changes so that were required. What was the attraction for you? If there was more risk than anything else you've ever done. The, the potential for reward, right? I, and what's the reward? If you look at what, the reward, is simply how much money you make for you. No, look, I, I don't you keep score or what. No, I don't need more money. Uh, I'm not. I'm not motivated by uh, financial returns. I, I'm motivated by one. I want to have a great uh, uh, track record. You know, if you look at Buffett, he's had a whatever a 60-year uh, track record. So I've got. Uh, I'm 20 years in, uh, but the record's been good so far. But you know, I'd like to have one of the best track records. What's the business. annual growth? 
I'm not allowed to comment on returns. Um, that's, a, that's an SEC restriction. But the, um, you can look around there. I'll tell you, they're quite good. But what I like, you know, I've done a lot of philanthropic work over the last uh, number of years. I actually think I make a much greater contribution through what I do you have. in the in my for-profit activities than I do in my not-for-profit well, And not activities. only that, you sign a giving pledge. That is true. Right. That is true. Um, this is very true. Meaning that you don't want to leave it to your children, you're going to leave it to half of it at least. Yeah, so charity. Well more than half. Yeah. Well more than half. Um, but but what's, I think what people forget uh, is, you know, Wall Street has, unfortunately, in the last, uh, certainly since the crisis, gotten a pretty bad name. But Wall Street is responsible, is, is probably the biggest engine for job creation, you know, enabling businesses to access capital, enabling businesses to, to grow. I mean, you look at uh, Howard Hughes was a, a creation out of thin air. It's now a business that employs, you know, it's going to ultimately employ thousands of people, create a ton of jobs. You think the criticism of Mitt Romney during the campaign for his activities uh, in running a private equity firm went there? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, I think... Uh, good private equity investors create a lot more economic value than they destroy. And, uh, and, and grow more jobs than they save? They grow a ton of jobs. I think the biggest risk with private equity... Save jobs that would be going away. The biggest problem with private equity is some, there are periods of time with private equity firms use too much leverage, which puts too much pressure on a business and, and risks a business's failure. Mm -hmm. Putting aside that, I think you know, the, the top private equity firms create a lot of economic value. Too much leverage and too much was, was part of the problem of the economic recession we went through. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're not going to save the country with philanthropy, despite the fact I, you know, I'm philanthropic. I don't think that's going to solve our economic what issues. What will save the country? We'll save the country our good economic policies uh, that create the right incentives and a administration that's supportive of the business community. I think that's actually very, very important. And uh, you know, policies that will make us competitive globally. You know, it's a, it's a global economy. Uh, you, there's a story today, I think, in today's journal about companies merging with uh, European businesses to move their operations offshore from a tax point of view. We have to have a tax policy that discourages that kind of activity. So you can bring the money home. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at the Is United States. That's the idea. Have a tax policy so that the money can come home rather than leaving offshore, so you don't have to pay taxes on it. Yes, but I, I think if you, th you know, the United States is not dissimilar uh, to the kind of companies we invest in. We invest generally in very good companies that have lost their way. And with better management, enormous value can be created. If you look at Canadian Pacific, this was a dying That's railroad. That's one of your investments. And it's a dying railroad under Hunter Harrison in a very short order. You know, less than you know, a year and a half, he's made dramatic changes to the business. The president is the CEO of this business that we call America. And the decisions he makes with respect to you know, the way incentives are designed, the way he works with Congress as a, as a leader in effectuating uh, policy change can make an enormous difference in the growth rate of the country, in job creation, in happiness, in our safety. Um, so I, think, I think that we, we can't diminish the importance of business and business practices. I mean, you look at what Bloomberg has accomplished as a mayor of, of, of New York City. He took uh, his for-profit mentality and uh, has applied it to a city and I think the city has accordingly thrived. I'd love to see the same thing happen for the country. That's tough management, too. Yeah. It, it, it's also, he has the benefit of independence. Um, Financial independence. It's enormous benefit. So you're not obligated to anybody particularly. Very important. So we should not elect rich people? No, um, but we should, I think that there's a lot to be said uh, to have someone with uh, a business background making decisions about the economy. Just for just because I don't quite understand this, I mean, are hedge is hedge fund performance down? Uh, if you yes, if you look at the overall statistics, yes. And why is that? Uh, the, the answer is there. I think there are a lot more participants. Uh, I think that there have been. So it looked like it was it was just a a sweet place to be, and it's less sweet now. It's become a much greater percentage of the amount of capital that's invested, right. and the scale uh, by just the math makes it harder for that capital to grow. At, a high enough rate. I also think there's been some regulatory change that's made it harder for certain kinds of hedge funds to make money. You know, I think it used to be that um, you know people could uh, uh, you, you hear of hedge funds that would just you know ask enough questions that they would get answers ahead of the market. I and mean, there's some there was some bad behavior that took place, and, and the government yeah, put in place. They've had some insider trading issues as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of the crackdown on that stuff has maybe taken away some of the bad returns from from the business. But I think the biggest driver has been uh, the uh, the fact that the business has scaled. Um, but look, it's just like the mutual fund industry. As a collective, it, it's not particularly 
attractive place to invest your money. But, if, but there are a few very good mutual fund managers who've done a lot better than the market over time. Same thing's true for hedge funds. Same thing's true for investors in real estate. If you weren't an investor, what would you be? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would do what I do now even if I weren't compensated uh, for doing it. Um, because I think it's a way for me to make the biggest contribution that I can make. I mean, I, I, look, I think about uh, government, if I could, if I could effectuate change the same way I can effectuate change in the, in the private sector. But I think I can have more influence as a private participant than a, than a public participant.